With the works, there's two distinct types of works approached. One is scenes of violence in film, and right. ones are scenes of tenderness. And so what I thought was, in most of the art world, a lot of the work I make is based upon the fact that I think the general man out there is really bored, and women, when they go into art galleries and museums, they feel so disconnected from work. So I said, what images can I pick that, that really affect me and really mean something? And to be honest, the things that I think mean the most people are when they go home at night, and they spend time with the person they love. And they show the, the, all the things that go through, the hard times that go through in life, and they expose that to the loved one, and the loved one takes care of them. So you have these scenes of, like in the background here, you have one called the patient. You have all these scenes taking, these scenes taking place between uh, men and women, where they reveal themselves to each other at their most vulnerable. But then you have the exact opposite, which is the men fighting, which gives me excuse to do these really violent, hard-moving images which have an undercurrent for me of Bacon and Francis Bacon and people like that. In terms of nostalgia, movie nostalgia it's not, doesn't mean anything to me, right. only insofar as the image itself. The images I pick, most, most of the time I try to pick images that you're not going to know the people, because I really don't care that they're film stills. It's only that they're images no one looks at anymore. Yeah. These are images from the 40s and 50s of two-bit B-movie actors that no one actually looks at. And this idea of that actor who's now dead and no one looking at images, I love that. So I'm taking his images like I did in the Lost Model series and the Army series and I'm bringing that back to life. I'm bringing it back into the realm and people are seeing it again but then I'm transforming it through paint. So there's a complete recontextualization. Going back to the, the, the pictures of violence, there's something very uh, uh, staged about the violent scenes, some of them. Uh, as you say, the old westerns, 40s and 50s film, the violence was that bit more hammy. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking at them, I got a sense that uh, maybe you were thinking that a lot of violence is posturing. Some people see that. Some people are seeing that there's some kind of slapstick quality to them that's like the, these uh, old movies where people are like going, going full end. You can obviously see that this is false. When I first looked at the images, that's what I saw, and that's part of the reason I picked them. I love this opportunity to paint violence, and I want to maybe in the future paint images that are of genuine violence, and may do that. But initially, I loved the stage violence and the fact that it was so evidently false. But I still like that it, it, it is portraying violence. I definitely like that, and I like having, but it is only on the basis that it's contrasted with the tender scenes, and not into just painting a violent image. I saw in these images yeah. old staged paintings that were like Caravaggio. Caravaggio would have set up everything, Rembrandt would have set up everything. I said, right, I'm going to use the photo, that's my setup. I don't have the money for models. Yeah. I can't put all that together. I don't have money for a photographer to do it. I have to work with these images if I want to work with exciting images. So I troll the internet, find these things and go, that rocks my world, that's a great image. I think it will affect other people when they look at it. The images of the couples seem to be uh, to me, slightly, I felt slightly voyeuristic mm. uh, and it made me a little bit uncomfortable because it seemed like I'd stumbled into a room where people were having this sort of really tender, private moment. intimate private moment between yeah. them and uh, did you, was that very much your intention? Oh, 100%. Like, uh, once again, these are images that I've, I've chosen out of thousands. So yes, a lot of time was spent in building up the psychology in these heads, when you look at the head, there's so much emotion in the head that you really do feel that this is such a personal moment that, you, as you said, you're someone. How do you trap presence within an image so when you see it, it's like the image is breathing? And this is something that's constant in all the work that I genuinely believe in brilliant art. The art actually appears to me like it's breathing. This is something that's uh, very strong in a lot of your works, uh, some particularly uh, the piece with um, the two male figures <coughs> and the one female figure in, in, in white. Yeah. Uh, it does have an element that it actually feels like there's a strong vitality to it. Yeah. Um, this is something that many critics have said about Velazquez, that he, he, his pieces managed to have an aura and a space and a gravity in and of themselves. Um, did you find it very difficult to achieve that effect, or was it absolutely natural to you? Well, I would never, no way was it natural. <laughs> Jesus, no way. This has been three years of just looking at Blasquez and trying to just understand how are these done. And then also, I do have to mention a person also named Velasquez in uh, America who studied the medium 
for 10 years of what did Velasquez actually use. And the sky he, you found on the internet. Yes, yeah. and he's invented a thing called calcite sunoil. So I say to all artists out there that they should really look this up, calcite sunoil. It's brilliant, there's a video on YouTube on it. But this hasn't been used in all the work, but it's used in Death in Monte Carlo. Right. And this really showed actually it created the surface of what a Velasquez is like. Four or five different glass layers. And we're not talking glazing here, it's quite different. It's four or five layers of paint that all work together in unison. But you still can see each layer. While with modern techniques, a lot of layers are blocked. And this is the brilliant thing, Velasquez. But the sense of area, yeah. Um, the three images, uh, part of that relates also to David Lynch, the director. Right. who I love his films, I love the sense of old world and the hairstyles which we'll see in a lot of these, I love them, I love the perfect hair going back um, the women having these amazing locks in their hair there's just something so mysterious about that whole world that I love and this is another reason why there's this aesthetic here but I'm fusing that with the beauty of paint that Velasquez used hardly any paint on the canvas when we film this later on and we see the canvas, there's nothing, the canvas like that there's only six, seven colours used on a lot of the paintings uh -huh. There's nothing there, and in all the study I've done with Velasquez, I don't portray in any way to be able to paint like I did. That, that's an impossibility, but um, hopefully I can just learn some things from what I found when I started painting, I paint the heads first, and I found what started to happen was the heads were hovering in this beautiful space, and I began to find I didn't need to do anything more, that the head was so powerful, because ultimately it's about how to contain the pres pressure and presence of the head on the canvas and make it just explode with energy, have so much potent energy that it's, it's got a reality that's quite different, but we'll get to that later, but in terms of the bare canvas, this seemed to amplify that for me, that this thing of changing an original, an image that seems to be just a rendering of an old photo, we want, we want that that changes completely into something completely new. It can't be the photo, it has to be something completely turning that on its head within the painting. Otherwise for me the painting fails. So I began to find this bare canvas was really doing that for me. And yet some people see this glowing quality and that's great. If that's creating a sense of presence and an aura around this head that can just jolt a person for a second and see a new reality that's, that, that is success for me. The Surrealists got into this over-academic approach and really tried to force this other surreal reality. Picasso said, I didn't forget about the paint. They did. So the paint must remain as the most important, potent symbol of the painting itself. So hopefully the way these are painted is, is people can see the nice qualities in the paint. Are you consciously thinking of a lot of these uh, great uh, old masters. I really want to emphasize this thing of how I just really appreciate the craft of painting and the respect for that. And I have all my books around me. So when I'm doing a painting, anything I need to do that painting, all the images that I think in some way will help me, I have them all on the floor around me. And I paint the image and I just keep looking at all these paintings. And I'm hoping subconsciously it goes in, that's how that piece of fabric was painted. That's how this was painted. It's important to note though that the, the only painting painted fully in the way like Velasquez is obviously the study and then the one here in the middle, Death in Monte Carlo. All the others are my own style I've come up with of this really thin way of painting because it works quickly for me. It just The image appears to me and it's just as much a shock to me that I've done it as it would be for people to look and go, that, that's okay actually, you know? It, it's just as much for me, I go, oh, God, that's a beautiful head. Like the two heads over here of a uh, soldier never truly comes home. I stayed painting 17 hours, I painted through the night and did the two heads because I can't stop in terms of the, if the paint dries, the technique doesn't work. This technique of come up with, you have to stay. So I can only do a small section at a time because it must be done wet and if it doesn't work, I wipe it down. It's gone and I start again. Giacometti always said his greatest asset when, when working was often his brother, because he'd pull him away from the piece when he knew it was done. Oh, when he thought it was done, that's right, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, and he'd save he him as well. Exactly, otherwise he would have just kept working, kept working. That's right, and you, pair them down to, them down to down just the nub of the support. <laughs> Do you find that's uh, good, you know it that. a lot easier to, <laughs> to know when a piece is finished? or In this body of work, definitely, and I think also, and this is 
going out to all the younger artists out there who find it, not that I'm not still quite young, but who find it difficult and hard because they keep painting over paintings. Like I've done that too. I painted over, I had four or five works when I've got that were two years old. I'd done 15, 16 times, just kept painting over them, they became new images. But in this I decided I wanted to really create really clean images that were really difficult to make. Really difficult. They required an awful lot of skill and craft to realise them the way I did. But I said I'm going to take my time and just really every brushstroke make it beautiful and make it really try and count. Have to subvert the reality of the original image more. Some of these are touching on that. And what I mean by that is is that I have a given image, I project it on the canvas and I'm working, I paint the head, whatever, and I try and push the head more and more so it's really painterly, but it has to actually go even further. It's got to be destroyed in some way. Now that's a problem because I, don't, I want to be respectful of the human being, the figure, but for some reason within the Western psyche and within paint, there's a demand near you to destroy, which is interesting, to destroy the figure. That's interesting, isn't it? You look at Picasso, the figure is ripped apart, remade, destroyed. You look at Francis Bacon, ripped apart, remade. Viciously so, yeah. Violently yeah. so. Now, he would say the paintings were beautiful. He didn't see them as that. But most people are excited or disturbed because they see that. This piece here, the patient, is um, uh, when I saw the, the initial image, there's a gun on the table. There's different things in the original photograph. The background's completely different. Hair is different. Loads things are different. Yeah. Change a lot. But what I actually saw was, when I looked at it, I saw something completely different. I actually saw a man going down the bed to a woman who was dying of cancer. And he's coming into the room, it could be a hospital or a private house. And she has accepted, and you see in her face, what I really tried to convey was, she's fully accepted that she's going to die. And there's this peace has come over her, complete peace. This is why this is called a patient. And he comes in and he's trying to be brave and if you look at his face, he, he doesn't know what emotion to put on his face. He's trying to smile, he, he, he's confused, his eyes are red like he's nearly about to cry. That was really hard to do to get all those emotions trapped into that head. But in her, you have these lips just going, shh. And I love that, that face, certain aspects of her face, her eye, when I, when I did the eye and the mouth, I was like, oh my god, it's... I was so happy that day, like I was just so happy and I really told her this is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful heads I ever did. But once again, hopefully this is where art helps people.